Hello Globalicious class, Dr. Maiden here with a video on our Global Issues 4.8 lecture. So this is the climate change and global politics lecture. So this is chapter 24 in the book, 4.8, climate change and global politics. Okay, so this should be a little bit of a shorter lecture compared to some of the others because there's a couple of videos. Uh, when, I, when I did this last year, we did the videos, then we did more of a discussion themed off the videos. Obviously, it's going to be a little bit tougher to do that with this class. So as you've noticed, probably if you're looking at the PowerPoint, it's much shorter. There's only a couple of slides. And then we really were getting into, particularly since this is such a hot topic issue, hot, ha, huh, get it, pun intended. Um, sorry, that one was really lame. Uh, <laughs> I'm tired. I'm tired, guys. This has been a lot of work. This has been really stressful to do these videos. Um, anyway. Hot topic issue like climate change, a highly politicized issue like climate change, um, I wanted to make sure that we had time to have discussion. We're gonna figure out how best to do this. Hopefully we'll be using the comment box below this video a little bit more than in some of the other videos. But let me do just a general overview here of both kind of environmentalism and climate change as these two aspects of politics and some of the challenges that they present. Okay, so obviously there are some classical concerns here, classic concerns largely coming out of the industrial era, things like conservation of natural resources and the damage caused by pollution. So the industrial era, era really brought these to light, the idea that, hey, <laughs> there's a lot of us on this earth and there's a finite number of resources we will get to a point where we will use all of these resources. So we need to think of ways of conserving the resources that we have. We need to think of ways of changing from energy sources that can be depleted to energy sources that are more renewable, okay? So the idea of there will come a point where we will dig all the coal out of the earth. What will we do when we reach that point? So conservation becomes a very big element of environmentalism, environmental politics in the global sphere. The other one, damage caused by pollution. So it's the idea, again, of we share this world, we share this air. Air pollution issues in China can affect us here in the US because air moves all around the globe, right? So a big challenge or you know, a big thing that can test, can test relationships between countries. Think of something like um, the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers in the Middle East. These are life bringing rivers to several countries. And the challenge can become how far downstream am I compared to my neighbors in using the same water? So if a country like Iran or Iraq damages in any way their water source or puts things into that water source, then whoever is the nearby country that gets that water next they're gonna be dealing with the challenges of whatever was introduced to that water source. Another one, think of the Nile, that it has to cross through South Sudan and Sudan and Egypt before it spills into the Mediterranean, okay? So there's lots of issues of what are the damages caused by pollution? How do we mitigate these challenges given the fact that we have to share this world and share these resources? So just like everything else we've talked about, right, with the international law lecture, there is always a convention for that. 1972, UN Convention on the Human Environment, the UNCHE. And what this convention did was really sought to solidify the dominance of what we know now. We've been talking about it since I think week one, right? Caitlin gave us our vignette on the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals. The 1972 convention on the human environment is what solidified the sustainable development agenda. We have to be thinking about these core environmental concerns of conservation and pollution, and we have to be thinking more strategically about sustainable development, okay? So a lot of what we're seeing with international environmental politics at this point largely mirrors in the public policy world, it's what we call the issue attention cycle. So we will create a crisis over time and it's not until the issue becomes realized that we'll say, oh, hey, 
there's a challenge here. Let's throw everything we have at addressing it, right? Because our issue, this issue, has caught our attention. So you can think of something like CFCs, chlorofluorocarbons, where there's the huge push of, oh my gosh, we've got a hole in the ozone from what we are doing. We have to fundamentally rethink hairsprays. We have to fundamentally rethink refrigerators and the coolant that they use. Okay, so AC, like AC units as well. So our issue, an issue catches our attention and we get very absorbed in trying to correct it. And then we'll go on our merry way and feel like, oh, we fixed that. Phew, what's going to be the next thing? That's largely been what we've had to do in environmental politics. We've relied very much on improving scientific knowledge. Uh, we don't know there's a problem until we know there's a problem. And then once it's caught our attention, we try and handle it. That's largely been what we've been doing for the past several decades in this field. So when we're thinking about, okay, what do we do? We find out we have this issue. In what ways do we bring attention to it? How do we attempt to mitigate it? We're going to take it back to a couple, of a couple of weeks ago where we talked about law. There has been a very huge growth in international environmental law. This is a very big field. There's lots of opportunities here. So international environmental law has a number of different goals. We're looking at doing things like increasing cooperation. So like I said, something like a shared waterway. Every country that touches the Nile has to use the Nile in some way. We need cooperation for how we handle that resource. Control, reform, future planning. These are all goals of the environmental law agenda internationally. How are we going to control the rate at which we uh, frack oil, do offshore drilling. We have laws for that. We have uh, procedures and protocol. We're reforming practices when we realize we're doing something like, hey, this is destroying the natural environment. Let's reform our practices so we don't do this anymore. And if you don't reform your practices, you can get fined for it. You can get in trouble. You can get shut down. You can get audited, right? Uh, a lot of other things that we have attempted to do in the field of environmental law is focus on, again, this idea of transboundary trade and pollution control. So when we're dealing with uh, transboundary trade of things like animals, fishing, pollution control in terms of water, it's created a lot, a host of, we call them MEAs, Multilateral Environmental Agreements. So this is where uh, you can imagine like in Southeast Asia, imagine a, an organization from our IO lecture, imagine something like ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, coming together and coming up with protocols for fishing in that area of the world. They have to have protocols. Everyone wants the fish. There have to be rules in place of how many you can take, when we need to give a certain area of the ocean a break so that they can repopulate, that we have to move around and cull different populations, right? All these different MEAs can come into being for these specific environmental issues. So some of the improvements we have seen then in terms of environmental protection improvement. We've seen a lot of things like norm creation. Just think of something like save, save the whales, save the dolphins radically transformed the tuna fishing industry. The fact that tuna fishing corporations before the Save the Dolphins movement were catching a heck of a lot of dolphins in their nets. Okay, so norm creation, the idea that we should protect dolphins, you shouldn't fish for dolphins. You should uh, change your practices so that you don't catch them. The whaling industry that we shouldn't catch whales. We need them in the ocean for X, Y, Z reasons. You can imagine something like um, the major backlash that has been happening even more recently about things like shark fin soup. Okay, so sharks that will be taken very much like poachers with rhinos or elephants. You're just hacking a body piece off and throwing it back in the water. Same thing was happening to sharks, just taking their dorsal fins off, which kills them, and then leaving their corpses, not using them for anything else, and taking too many of them, destroying populations. So norm creation comes in and says, no, this is wrong. This is fundamentally wrong. We're going to build out reasons why this is wrong, and we're going to stop doing this thing. Okay. Also, same thing that we've talked about with other aspects of international law, um, 
it aids in capacity building. So by building out laws, it helps countries, it helps corporations know better what to do, know how to do it, improving our scientific understanding, knowing best practices for how to do it. Okay, so we want to do it, we're going to keep doing it, but we want to do it right. And we want to do it in ways that it's sustainable. We want to log in ways that it's sustainable. We want to coal mine in ways that it's sustainable. Everything has this focus of how do we keep this going to protect the commons, all right? So if you're following along with the slides, what we're at now is this idea of the commons and more importantly, the tragedy of the commons. So if you know what this is, go ahead and, and give me a good definition down below if you think you know what this is. Um, ha, funny, you could even just copy and paste the definition on my slide if you want, but um, go ahead if you've, if you've heard of this before, tragedy of the commons, let me know what it is or give me a good example of it from your perspective. I'm gonna dive in right now and explain it and use my own example. So the tragedy of the commons is this idea that in a shared resource system, individual users will act independently according to their own self-interest. What does this sound like already right now? Hopefully it's ringing some bells and you're thinking realists, right? Realists are all about self-interest, my own self-interest at the expense of yours. I don't care, it's at your expense if that's gonna help me. So people act in their own self-interest and they behave contrary to the common good of all by depleting or spoiling the shared resource through collective action. So an example would be something like US corporations extracting oil from Nigeria using devastatingly harmful practices of extraction that have led to almost the total decimation of the Delta state. Okay, so Nigeria will never recover. The Delta state, uh, it's anticipated, will never recover from the environmental harm that has been done to that region from us spoiling their other resources, spoiling their water, spoiling any land that they had that they could have been using to farm with, to build houses with, to develop on, completely and utterly spoiled. Entire populations, entire ecosystems in the Delta system have been killed off because of the oil spill practices um, and the fact that they're not cleaned up properly. Okay, so the tragedy of the commons becomes we operate in our own self-interest, so Shell or BP or Exxon, they're operating in their own self-interest because they have a bottom line, they have a dollar mark that they're trying to reach and they will spoil a resource for other people, all right? So a lot of the challenges that you will get, pollution, overfishing, deforestation, think of what was happening last semester, you probably saw it in the news, the idea of the Amazon is burning. Remember that was a huge thing in the news, the Amazon is burning. Well, it didn't take long for people to correct that rhetoric and say, no, actually the Amazon is being burned. There was lots of changes that were going on within Brazil. The president passed some new measures allowing for the burning of the Amazon to transition land into cattle farming land. All right, so it wasn't that the Amazon has just spontaneously caught fire. Yes, there are some natural fires, but they were also setting fires to clear land to engage in agricultural practices. All right, I have a video here now that you can link, so we're gonna take a pause. The video is linked down below, you can watch it. It's a case study video, it's very short, but it's focusing on this challenge of overfishing. Particularly being here in the Florida region, this is something that becomes a challenge. It's something that the Florida state government has to deal with, local governments have to deal with. Not only the challenge of overfishing, but there is such a thing also as underfishing. So even in this area, I know it's come up in class before, we've talked about something like the completely out of control lionfish population. And that in reality, we have an underfishing problem. We need to be getting those critters out of the water because they completely devastate the local ecosystem because they're not native to it. All right, so we'll take a pause here, uh, take a stretch, pause the video, get a drink of water, do what you need to do. We're gonna come back, talk briefly about climate change, but then I'm gonna be linking you to a couple of videos. So pause now, watch the overfishing video. It's pretty cool, it's got some interesting infographics, and then we'll come back together 
in just a minute. Okay, aloha and mahalo everyone. I'm back here to talk about climate change and I am wearing a very festive dollar store lay outfit for you. Hope you like it. Uh, so climate change, this is interesting to transition into this. Um, I want to be very transparent here and tell you my own positionality on this topic. I am a climate change researcher. I have published in the world of climate change. I have published in a journal called Regional Environmental Change. And the whole point of my article was that we were talking about climate change. And so the way I addressed this in my previous class when I taught this lecture is, as you'll see from the two videos I've linked out for you, I am not going to engage with you so much the politicization of climate change. I want us to focus more on, uh, the videos will do that a little bit. I want us to focus more because this is a university and because this is a social science, but we're, we're, we try and be a science. I want us to mo focus more on the angle of the science side of this, okay? I want to get the science perspective out there because it is something that in the media today, particularly in the United States, in our media today, there is a very definite skewing that is going on here. I have two videos that I want you guys to watch. They're really, really good videos. Obviously, they're linked down below. Um, you can pause, especially if you wanna watch the one now called Climate Consensus, that there is climate, climate consensus. You can go ahead and pause and watch that one now or wait just a couple minutes. I'm going to uh, talk a little bit and then you could pause and watch that video. All right, but so when we're thinking about climate change and international relations, what the, what the video in particular, the, the consensus video, which is very good, watch it. What the consensus video is talking about is the fact that since the 1980s, there has been overwhelming consensus across disciplines, everything from soil scientists, political scientists, climate scientists, climatologists, hydrologists, people that study agriculture and crop yields, you name it. You name the scientific industry that's looking at climate change and they will say, this is a done deal. We have agreement on the fact that climate change is real, man-made climate change is a real thing. Now you do get where you see the most disagreement is the so what do we do about it question what do we do about it how best should we address it that's where you get a diversity of opinions which is really useful honestly because you want people looking at this issue from as many different angles as possible so solutions that a country like the u.s could put forward are going to look fundamentally different than solutions that laos is going to put forward because we're in completely, completely different situations, okay? So when we're looking at what are the threats, what are the threats globally that we are gonna be sharing th these threats? What are some of the challenges? Unusual weather patterns, we're already seeing that. We're seeing a shortening of winters, an extending of summers. We're seeing shortening of raining, rainy seasons. I mean, ask any of my friends that are farmers in Malawi and they will tell you they have been feeling this for years. It's not a sudden thing. It has been a gradual thing that it is a speed, but a speeding up of the summer. The summers are lasting longer. The rainy seasons are shorter and it's really, really a challenge for, for growing crops in particular. Storm events, there are more of them. They tend to be more catastrophic than they have been. The melting of the polar ice sheets, global warming via the emissions. We talked about already things like creating a hole in the ozone. Um, pollution is also having a big issue. So these are, all, these are all global challenges that we are facing as a global community. And really one of the things we could talk about in a discussion section would be the extent to which, okay, who's really gonna feel the burden of these things first? Who's gonna feel them hardest? And here I could refer you back to the day-to-day -day that we did where I showed you the Notre Dame Global Adaptation Index. I'll link it down below again and you can take a look because that's, that's really important. This could be a great topic for you to do something like a Marxist analysis. If you are wanting to do um, a world systems theory analysis where you're saying, okay, 
who is most vulnerable to climate change and who is most ready to adapt. And you'll notice that often those that are most vulnerable are also least ready to adapt. And there's a reason for that. Go in and look and say, hmm, is this a core country or is it a periphery country? There should be no surprise that those that are most vulnerable, least ready to adapt are periphery countries. And the big discussion question that comes out is, well, what incentive do we have to stop? What incentive do countries that are least vulnerable and most ready to adapt, what incentive do we have to stop what we're doing? Is there any incentive to adjust practices so that we're protecting the most vulnerable and the least ready to adapt? That's a big question I think that's important to be asking. From a realist perspective, you can sit and ask from a realist perspective. Do we have any incentive? Should we stop? From a liberal perspective, do we have an incentive? Should we stop? From a post-colonial perspective, right? So as you're thinking through your paper, you can take a topic like this that's very highly politicized, that people have a lot of differing opinions, pick a side and argue it. Go all in, right? So I'll stop there because I don't want these videos to get too long. Please go in and watch the two videos. So the one video is talking about the climate science, where we've come from, what direction we're going, and where the consensus is. The other one I've linked then is more of a comedy video. It's very good though. It's four minutes. It's from Last Week Tonight. If anyone ever watches Last Week Tonight with John Oliver, he does a really good job. He brings on a special guest star. Um, I may or may not ask you in your quiz who the special guest star is. Um, go ahead and watch all those videos. Take a look. Comment down below if you have things that you want to share about either environmentalism or climate change. And I really challenge you, the discussion question that I'll ask will be really challenging you to think through picking a perspective and diving in and saying, you know, especially with this challenge of the tragedy of the commons, the shared global commons, what incentive do we have as, as American citizens, as the US government to correct our behavior? Do we have any incentive? If you can say, yes, maybe it's just a moral incentive, is that enough? Is a moral incentive enough to get us to correct our behavior? Okay, so take a look, take a look at the videos, comment, question down below, um, and hopefully uh, this may be one of the last lectures that I have to give this way. And if not, I will uh, I will see you next week. I'm ready. I'm raring to go. I'm I'm decked out. Let's do this. All right. Have a great day.